чуть-чуть убрать, чтобы не скрипело. Можно на балансе просто и мы уже начнем. Сегодня нашим гостем в Гиперионе будет никто иной, как Эдди Ленихан. А, на самом деле, один из самых известнейших шанахи, ирландских сторителлеров, мастеров рассказа. А, и так как Эдди родом из Бросне, а, это графство Керри, и на самом деле очень известная культурная область шли в Лухра, так называемая, которая знаменита своей музыкой, своими танцами, своими песнями, своими национальными, в общем-то, ирландскими поэтами, ну и в том числе и, с, и а, очень славными сторителлерами. А, поэтому мы в честь Эдди сыграем три мелодии из Бросны. И потом начнем.
спасибо. Ну, надеемся, теперь Эдди согрелся после нашего лютого русского мороза. И мы когда немножко еще согреемся, потом вам еще поиграем мелодии из разных частей Ирландии. А, вот. Живет сейчас Эдди, на самом деле, в Грасте Клэр. Еще одном Грасте знаменитым своими традициями. Вот. А, у него семья из шести детей, на самом деле. Вот. Которые, некоторые из которых живут дома в Клэре, некоторые из которых разъехались по всему свету, в Германии, Малайзии, женились там. Вот. Но один из сыновей а, интересуется делом жизни Эдди. Вот. А дело жизни Эдди заключается в том, что он коллекционирует, а, по сути, записывает, на самом деле занимается настоящей интеграфической работой, истории у обычных людей, у обычных рассказчиков, собирая их, в общем-то, по деревням. А, и старается делиться этими историями со всеми желающими, как бы без какого-то такого э, скрупулезного научного подхода, именно передавая то, что ему рассказывают, неадаптированные истории, настоящие. И то, что вы сегодня слышите, на самом деле, я хочу вам сказать, это не те сказки, которые вы, скорее всего, э, могли до этого видеть в сборниках. Это самые настоящие неадаптированные ирландские рассказы, как они есть, со всеми ужастиками, которые там могут присутствовать, со всем юмором. Э, ну, соответственно, я думаю, вам понравится. Э, встречаем Эдди Ленихан. Talking nonsense again, is he? You're, ta you're taping, is it? Now, the only bother, you see, is I don't sit down when I'm telling stories. I don't like to sit down. <laughs> I'm not the kind of storyteller that used to sit like him and Kelly sitting and talking like that, you know. Would you like to take it out? I would a bit. If you want to take it out to there, we'll say, give me a bit of space. Give me a bit of space because, you see, um, I can't move too far anywhere because I'd fall off the stage. I don't want to break my neck. I have a few other things to do as well. Uh, but, you know, just a bit, just a bit. You know, just give me a small bit of space. And, you know. <laughs> oh, Lord, will you stop? It's getting worse. It's getting worse. Now, fair enough, fair enough. That'll give me that'll give me a bit of room that way at least. Now, at least I know where I'm going. I, I keep it. I, I keep you in mind, right? Fair enough. Uh, now, I don't know what kind of stories you like. Give me an idea. Horror. Horror. <laughs> <laughs> the Rus the Russian liking for horror. <laughs> Is that, is, is that because of the dark forests or because of Mr. Uh, Putin? <laughs> um, no. All right. Horror. There are plenty of horror stories in Ireland, too. I have uh, one of the CDs. There is Six Terrible Women. <laughs> so, uh, volume one. <laughs> so there are plenty, plenty space for horror I in Ireland as well. And um, I tell you, I brought this up now. Unfortunately, I have only one copy of it left. 
the fairy book and a man down there has bought it but he kindly allowed me to bring it up here to show you uh, the Irish fairies since you mention horror are not like your as I had to explain uh, to in a previous session they're not like the Walt Disney fairies they're not like you know the little pointy ears and the, you know the, the, they're not like the tooth fairy and all the rest of it the Irish fairies well you get on the wrong side of them and you're dead simple as that and I put together that uh, collection all collected by myself from old people because I've been collecting stories now for the past 37 years uh, in fact I started collecting uh, the very year I got married <laughs> that'll tell you how long I've been married for the last 37 years so I, col I started in 1976 and I've been collecting ever since and that collection is for all that I've collected myself I didn't have to go to the archives for any of that and some of the stories in that are pretty horrible by any standards they're all fairy stories meeting the other crowd the other crowd are the fairies in Ireland there are many names for the fairies because the old people used not call them the fairies they used to call them Nadine Ushle, the noble people Bunachnik, the people of the hills Nadine Ella, <laughs> the other people they had a lot of you know, sideways names for them rather than calling them the fairies straight out because if you did the, the danger was you know you might insult them and if you did if you insulted the fairies you had no chance because what chance have you against people who can make themselves invisible like that none none they can become invisible if they like uh, visible if they like invisible if they do if they don't want to you have no chance against people like that so now let me tell you a story uh, about and you consider it horrible or not now this isn't particularly horrible but I believe it's a true story and I'll tell you why I believe it because my mother was mm, partly involved now my mother died at the age of 49 a very young age to die and there were three of us in the family me the eldest my sister the second and my brother who was the youngest and my, bro my brother was only uh, five years old when my mother died and my father was a harness maker and as you might guess to be left with a young family at a time 1969 uh, my father didn't know what to do you know it wasn't the fashion for men to bring up families then uh, and <laughs> a workman like him even though he was a skilled tradesman it was tough but he did it he did it and I give him great credit he's long dead now too but he put three of us through university that took a great man to do but he did it but he had he had one help and it was a neighboring woman no no relative whatsoever but a good friend of my mother's and she stepped in now she didn't have to but she did and she did what she could she was a farmer's wife and uh, just out of goodness just out of common decency she stepped in and did what she could now H Hannah was her name her surname doesn't matter but Hannah was her name and I, I never forget it for her I couldn't forget it for her and any time I would call to home after that she'd be the one I'd always call to first before any relatives or anybody else I'd always call to see Hannah because of what she did for us when when we needed it now she told me a story and I believe this story because I knew her so well she was like a second mother to us and I had no reason to disbelieve her but she told me this story and it was there was this neighbor near him also a farmer's wife and she was a strange woman strange in the sense that she'd know your business she'd know what you'd be doing inside in your own house now not that she was peeping in the window or anything like that no 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 you could be upstairs but she'd know what you would be doing and she could tell you the smallest details no not that you wanted to know <laughs> but she she would know 
You could be selling your cattle at a cattle fair 15 miles away. She'd meet you coming home in the evening and she could tell you exactly how much you had in your pocket, how much you had got for your cattle. People, she wouldn't have been at the fair at all, but she knew how much. Uh, people were frightened of her. You know, she, where, where was she getting this knowledge? But she was getting it from somewhere. Now, people eventually were keeping out from her, you know, that see her coming along the road, and they had to salute her. She was a neighbour. How are you? But they kept out and kept going. Now, the problem was she had three daughters. Lovely girls. Lovely, handsome girls. And the daughters grew up. Fine girls. Fine girls. They grew up into be marriageable age. The only bother was, <laughs> who was going to marry those daughters? With a mother like that? Uh-uh. Everybody would think, of course, they'd turn out like their mother, naturally. They were going to have to go to some other part of Ireland to get married, where the mother wasn't known at all. If, th if they wanted to get married, or else go into a convent. Now, her husband was a lovely man, also. So, you know, where the hell did she come from? Such a hag as she was. Anyway, time passed on and time passed on. And this particular day, over she came, across the fields, and into Hannah's mother's yard. And she says to Hannah's mother, I'm going to die soon. Will you lay me out for the wake? And Hannah's mother said, as any neighbour would, you know, you know, just to get rid of her. You die? Ah, you're not going to die. What are you talking about? No, she said, I'm going to die soon. Will you promise me that you'll lay me out, you know, for the wake? And just to get rid of her, Hannah's mother said, all right, all right, I promise. And, thank you, off she went. But, but, five or six weeks later, there was this terrible hullabaloo and noise and this 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 <laughs> and over came the three daughters and into the yard and there were an awful state of Jesus Christ oh, mother is dead oh mother is dead and Hannah's mother said well you know what to do clean the house tidy up lay her out because the neighbours they'll be coming for the wake no 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 so just come over come over quick and they were in such a state that Hannah's mother said oh, and over she went now Hannah says I was with her and over we went across the fields look there were neighbours after all we went just across the fields rather than go round by the road and into the yard the door was open now her husband must have been in town he wasn't there the door was open single story house I know the house I know the house myself and it still lived in and uh, we went into the kitchen. Nobody in the kitchen. The bedroom was off the kitchen. And the bedroom door was open. My mother, Hannah, said, went down, down as far as the bedroom door, looked in. Now, Hannah says, I was right at her shoulder. And what did we see inside in the bedroom, on the bed, except the old woman? obviously dead because the bed clothes were scattered you know she was obviously dead but it wasn't that at all that caught her attention but she was a moving mass of black chirurgs black beetles she was moving moving with them and of course we holy christ what's that and within five seconds gone and we were left there where are they? They were gone. Now, the problem was, my mother had given the promise to lay her out for her wake. And she had to keep that promise. And she did. Much against her will, I can tell you, after what we had just seen. But she did washed her, cleaned her, changed the bedclothes, 
did everything that you would see done it, well you wouldn't see it done but everything that would be done inside in the modern funeral parlour to prepare a person nicely for their death so that people coming in would see a nice clean corpse and bless themselves and all the rest of it and you know I presume you have the same here now uh, may, you know a person come in one door say their prayers go out the other door and there's the person laid out nicely inside the bed Hannah's mother did that, as she had promised, but I tell you, it nearly turned her stomach after what they had seen. What were those black things? And the funny thing, Hannah said, was those three daughters kept a clean house. So she knew that there was something wrong here. This was not natural. Anyway, anyway, the funeral took the wake took place. The funeral took place. Nobody else knew because when all the neighbours came for the wake, there she was, as natural looking as, as if it was a normal wake. She was buried. Mass was said in due course. She was buried. And that was that. But after the Mass, when Hannah and her mother went home, and they explained it to their husband, and they talked it over, because then they began to put two and two together and began to think, uh-uh, where was she getting all that power beforehand? The power of knowing your business, knowing the price of this and that, knowing what you were doing inside in your own house. And of course the conclusion that they had to draw was that it could only be from the fairies because they knew as well as any Irish person does that the fairies most often appear in the shape of something black like the black dog as in this case these black beetles these black as we would call them in Ireland Kirogues so now is there any proof? no but that's the conclusion they drew ha Hannah and, as I said, I, I believed her, that she saw them, because Hannah was no fool. And I knew her up to when she died about three years ago at the age of 94. And she had all her wits right up to the end. As I say, I used to call to her every single year, out of respect for my mother, who died in 1969, which is a long time ago. And Hannah, who helped us when we most needed it. So, you know, wh wh what do you say to these kind of things? I don't laugh at them. I certainly do not. So, ah, thank you for whoever supplied this. I, 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 I take this just now. Could I be heard at the back? Yes, please. My filthy Irish habits, milk with the tea. <coughs> They've tried to make me compromise here by 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 having lemon only, but I'm sorry I can't do that. <laughs> Black tea. And if you notice a shake in my hand, the reason for that is I'm off the Guinness for Lent. And um, that's bad. <laughs> to be to be off the beer is you know it gives you a terrible shake in your hand. <laughs> but I'll be going back on the Guinness after Lent, and I tell you my hand will be a rock steady again. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, you still asked me. You you asked me for something horrible. Oh, I'm sorry. What what? Okay, I better put away this man's book now in case anything will happen to it. Oh, by the way, if any of you do get your hands in a copy of that, the last story in that book is uh, where the fairies deal with a man who made a very rash um, statement and what happened to him. He promised that he would take the skin off of them. You don't do that in Ireland. It was they took the skin off of him, and the nails, and the teeth, and bit by bit by bit, they took him apart, 
hunting that took his life from him. All over setting spuds, potatoes, in a shady hold. He was a very foolish man. He had all to keep his opinions to himself where the fairies are concerned. In Ireland, it's safer to do so. Because, like I say, the fairies are not these little quaint creatures, you know, well, you know, as we have been told. They're very like us. And as one old man told me, a man I'll be visiting when I go home, he's again 94, strange enough, the same age as uh, the woman I'm talking about. Uh, he told me, when I asked him, tell me, Mikey, I said, what, what, what do they look like? Uh, and he said, they look like, just like us. He said, the person sitting next to you could be one of them. They can take any shape they like. And I thought that was one of the most frightening things I ever heard. Because, you know, when you think the person sitting, or the person next to you could be one of them. You know, that's kind of, oh, oh. When you think your best friend, the person you thought was your best friend, could be one of them. In the shape of your best friend. That would give you a little, a little bit of time for pause when you think about it. And sometimes it's true, isn't it? When you when you do think the person you thought was your best friend works out not to be quite that at all. Mm. Now, um, where I come from is only a small village between Limerick and Galway. Uh, it's only a small village with two pubs. Uh, I've discovered also that pubs really aren't the same here in Russia as they are in Ireland. Maybe you're lucky. Maybe you're lucky. Uh, in the sense that, well, maybe you're not. Maybe you're not. Because where there's no pubs, I find that people drink at home too much. At least in pubs, there's a closing time. Get out, lads. Go home. <laughs> you know, whereas when you drink at home, there's no closing time as we are beginning to discover, because all the stupid new laws, you can't drink and drive, you can't do this, you can't smoke in pubs, you can't do, it's all for our health, yeah, 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 <laughs> but, but, yeah, there's a limit, uh, you know, civilization too, uh, pubs, they were better long ago, for conversation, for this, for that, nowadays, it's wishy-washy, you know, but, but in any case, there's two pubs in Crochine. That's all. That's how small the place is. I go into one of them only. And the other one, there's nothing, lo there's nothing wrong with the other one. The other one is picturesque from the outside. It's thatched. It's old. 1908, I think. Um, the only reason I don't go in there is because it has no snug. You know, a little private room where you can go in. Now, usually I don't go into a pub just for drinking or for conversation. I go into a pub to get on with my writing. If I have letters to write or something like this. And it's lovely to have a private room where you can shut the door and go in. Now, <laughs> I take my briefcase to the pub. And it's funny, the old lads are the first to adapt. They'll joke me and they say, oh, you're going to your office again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, in a funny sense, you know, th th they don't resent it at all. But, uh, yeah, boys, no problem. And I go in there, shut the door and get on with it. Now, in the other one, it, the bar is too small. The middle room, there's no curtain or door. You have no privacy. And if the boys out in the bar get rowdy, y you can't even hear what you're doing in the middle room. That's why I don't go there. The people are nice. There's nothing wrong at all with the people. But in that pub one time, there was this man, big strong man. And once he'd have a few pints taken, he would get rowdy. Rowdy in the sense of loud, loud, loud. And he'd always talk about, oh, the great sportsman he was when he was young. And he was a good sportsman when he was young. Many is the man he had crippled on the field. Now, have you ever seen on television hurling? Now, you know, hurling, in the Irish hurling, they said the fastest sports, ga sports ga field game in the world. And it is. Uh, not a game for sissies. 
as we say, as, and soccer players are sissies by compared to this, you know. They go down, oh, 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 oh I'm crippled, I'm crippled. Uh, hurling, they wouldn't last two minutes at hurling, you know. T tis, it is a tough, tough game. And uh, this fella had been tough, and he was talking every night about the fellas he had crippled when he was young, and <coughs> stomped on him, and this. Probably had, probably had. A and, you know, constant, constant talk about this. And other fellas who were in the pub were saying, oh, Jesus, look at that <laughs> in the fucking mouth, you know, God bless them. They have to put up with this every night, and the price of drink so high. You know. But nobody said that to him. No one said it because he's a big man here in Texas. <laughs> throw you against the wall if you if you spoke up you know, so, and they had to put up with and you'd ask yourself why did they put up with this and simply people get into the habit of going to the pub they like they could have gone to the next pub no problem the price of drink was the same but you know yourself you know you get used to the place you go to and that's that and th here they were now giving out to themselves about this and you know, will he ever shut up, will he ever go away? He didn't, he didn't, he was the same every night when he'd have four or five pints drank and, and he could drink it. Hmm? Uh, uh, and he'd start and get louder and louder and louder as the night went on. This went on day after week after month after month after month and finally it was coming up towards Halloween and a couple of the boys put their heads together and now, at that time in Ireland, Halloween, and now today, it's a spooky, spooky, spooky time for children. But, you know, that's only nonsense spooky. Well, they put on plastic headstones, and they put on spooky hands plastic again, and witches' hats, and they go around with, yeah, that, begging for pennies and that kind of stuff. But in those days, Halloween was a spooky time. You know, genuinely, you know, even for older people, the belief was that it was safer to stay at home maybe on Halloween night because it was the changing time of the Celtic year. The kind of time that if you were out in the wrong place at the wrong time that night you mightn't come back because the veil between our world and the other world was very thin on that night. Don't risk it. Stay at home. Buy yourself a couple of beers and drink them at home if you were a drinker. Anyway, and they all knew that. They all knew that. He should have known it too, but he was so busy boasting and giving out that he didn't listen. And, uh, of course, you stay away from haunted places, especially that night. Like we'll say an old haunted castle ruin. Or, or especially a graveyard. <laughs> Bad place to be on Halloween night. <laughs> so anyway, the boys had their uh, plan prepared. And, of course, he started. Uh, Naturally. And at last, one of the boys leaned over and said, Hi, hey, hey, big man, you, you're always, you're always talking, hey. Do you know what night it is? He looked around. And, of course, they thought, no, he was going to strike out. One, one, one minute, no, one minute. Do you know what night it is? No, what? Halloween? No, no. We'll see whether you have a fuller talk or otherwise. Will you go up there now to Kyla Winner Graveyard, didn't so far, and bring back a skull? You see, the belief was that if you brought a skull from a graveyard on Halloween night, now it had to have teeth in it, and pull a tooth from that skull with your own teeth, <laughs> you'd have a cure for toothache from that night on. Now that, the thought that that is shut him up, surely. But, unfortunately, <laughs> he put his pint, oh no, there, there wasn't a full pint in it, his half pint, up on the counter, and he said, wait, I'll be back. <laughs> Out the door he went, and of course the boys, <laughs> they laughed. They said, that's the last we'll see of him. Peace, finally. <laughs> and, uh, they stretched to have their pints. Now, that pub is just on the side of the street nothing outside except footpath. He could have turned left or he could have turned right. If he turned left, go around the gable of the house and down a little lane where which would bring him the short cut to the pub. If he turned right, go straight down the street of Crusheen. But what do you think he did? Eh? He took the short cut. And, and he 
around the gable now today that little passageway is all overgrown at that time it wasn't he made straight for it and he crossed the railway the level crossing and into the field beyond now it was a bright night it didn't matter he knew where he was going because he lived nearby into the field beyond and he came to the side wall of the graveyard in a couple of minutes now as I told you big man hand on the side wall vaulted in and he had to be careful now because because it's an old graveyard it's still used but not much gravestones going that way and this way and grass it's not much tended the grass you know highly highly high uh, and he knew the belief of course <laughs> I, I don't know whether he believed it or not that if you cut yourself in a graveyard that wound will never heal so, mm, you know, safer, safer to be mm, shooed than sorry so he made his way carefully and carefully to where he knew there'd be bones because in Ireland at that time graveyards were not kept in a good condition I remember when I was young in County Kerry uh, when they'd be digging up graves uh, to bury somebody else they were careless they'd just throw out the bones and bits of coffins and very often they'd be thrown at the side of the graveyard wall instead of putting them back respectfully into the grave where they'd be putting back the new coffin now that's not done anymore the county councils make sure that everything is done properly but I remember when we were about seven and eight uh, as children we, there'd be a heap of bones in the corner of the graveyard and we there daring each other uh, I dare you to touch that bone you know <laughs> as children you know we never did of course we'd be frightened to do it but this man anyway he knew exactly where the bones would be because many is the grave he had dug in that graveyard and so he made his way and found the heap not was overgrown with briars and, and a couple of bushes but he got a bit of a stick and poked around looking for a skull pulled one out by one of the eye sockets and looked now the bottom jaw of course had dropped off no teeth in the top jaw threw it aside and poked around for another one pulled it out and big god there were two teeth <laughs> and of course teeth in a skull well they look a lot longer than they will in a living person because the gum has rotted away perfectly so it's lovely and I was looking <laughs> stuck it up under his coat and this time no out over the wall he didn't want to damage it uh, out the gate of the gra graveyard down along the station road up under the railway bridge and up the street listened at the door of the pub <laughs> the boys were enjoying themselves inside without him and imagine the surprise when he opened the door, walked in, oh, utter silence. Nobody expected him back. They all <laughs> thought he was gone home, and silence, of course. And when one of them got his voice, well, he said, D did you bring it? Hand up under the coat, threw the skull up on the counter, and it rolled along the counter. Now, put yourself in their position uh, they're having your pint and all of a sudden a skull rolls along the counter <laughs> of course they jump back and suddenly pop skull falls on the floor uh, and rolls into the corner and I tell you there was quietness in that bar <laughs> it took them a couple of minutes again to get their breath and their voice well says one of them you know what to do with it and the big man walked over picked up the skull and held it out in front of him now of course every eye in the house was on him would he do it or wouldn't he and, and you know big and all as he was his hands began to shake as the skull stared at him two empty eye sockets he didn't know whose skull it was naturally enough <laughs> but the hands began to shake and he couldn't do it <laughs> he threw the skull from him and ran out the door <laughs> and the funny thing is nobody laughed because they all knew they wouldn't have done it either and a short time afterwards the crowd broke up one man this way another man that way all went home 
and the barman came out and shoveled up the skull and into a bag. He'd take it back to the graveyard in the morning. Morning came and one of those men, a friend of the big man, they used to work together building walls for local farmers. He was waiting at the crossroads just opposite that pub. Now I live down the road about a quarter of a mile from that crossroads just past the school and uh, the friend was waiting there at the crossroads waiting for the big man to show up they had a wall to build and now in fairness to them they were very reliable good workers but there was no sign of the big man and the friend was you know where is he come on come on and he checked his watch you know checked his watch it was half past nine. He should have been here ten minutes ago. And he looked at the big man's house that was nearby. And the first thing he should have seen, of course, was smoke from the chimney. Breakfast. <coughs> but there was no smoke. Let me check this, he said. And he went to the door and he... No answer. And he... And still no answer. So he tried the latch and the door swung in. Oh, I've been in that house. It's not lived in now, but I have been in that house now. It's a good 15 years ago. A single story house, and I do know bedroom on the left, hallway, kitchen on the right, uh, old style kitchen, open fireplace, and as he stepped in, oh, the logical thing to do, he was hardly going to walk into anybody's bedroom, logical thing to do was try the kitchen. And that's exactly what he did. Down he went to the kitchen and, you know. But again, no reply. So he opened the kitchen door just a couple of inches, looked in, and the fire, there was no fire. The open fireplace, there was nothing there but the ashes from the night before. And he was staring, what the hell is here then? Where, where could he be? And as he stood there at the kitchen door, he had from behind him, he had this, 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 what, how would I, this, this strangled kind of a cry, this, you know, <laughs> and he looked back, it seemed to be coming from the bedroom, so he went back to the bedroom door and listened, and sure enough, it was from the other side of the door, this, 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 <laughs> he had to check it, so he did open the door, little, couple of inches and there inside in the bed was his friend all the bedclothes crunched scrunched up around him and his hands and his legs and his mouth that was twisted his eyes twisted back in his head and he All the, all the friend did was out to the shop next door and he said to the woman behind the till, he said, ring the doctor, ring the doctor. And she tried to, so who, will you just ring the doctor, quick. The doctor was phoned for. The doctor was there within 10, 15 minutes with his bag. Uh, wh where for? They pointed out where. The doctor went in, had a look. Oh God almighty, he said, what happened to him? He said, oh no doctor, we thought you might be able to do something. All the doctor did was phone for the ambulance from Ennis Hospital. Ambulance came, took him into the emergency department. I suppose they must have done what they could there for him. That's what they're there for. But within three days that man was dead. Big, strong, healthy man. They were all shocked. They brought him home anyway for the wake and for the funeral and he was buried. But after the burial, they came back into the pub, not to get drunk or anything like that, of course, but just to talk among each other, as you would have at any funeral in Ireland anywhere. Uh, just have a you know, drink for the road, and in this case, more to talk, you know, shock. What, what happened? How could this happen? And they were in the pub, gathered around the fire, mostly silent rather than talking, when there was
was a voice from the corner behind them and they said lads you did a mighty bad deed when you invited him up there to Kyla Winner graveyard and they looked back and it was an old man of the parish that they knew very well and one of them said what do you mean what are you talking about he said don't you know the old belief about Halloween and graveyards you thought you were being funny did you what are you talking about well he says just in case your parents never told you I'll tell you he says if you go into a graveyard on Halloween night and bring a skull out of it and pull the teeth out of that skull with your own teeth fine you will have a cure for toothache from that day on but if you go into a graveyard on Halloween night and bring a skull out of it and don't pull the teeth out of it with your own teeth from that night on you'll have every pain of every person that was ever buried in that graveyard and that obviously was what happened to a man and that's what killed him within three days because God only knows how many people it pained in their teeth that were buried in that graveyard so if any of you are tempted to have fun like that on Halloween night think again it might save your life thank you <laughs> enough for you. Um, I was told this story recently. Oh, sorry, maybe... Can I tell another one then? Maybe the musicians, if they want to, can give a tune. All right. I, uh, right. I'll, I'll tell you this one then. And... <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, it's a story I got recently from an old, uh, not such an old man. I got it by accident. I have been put off the road <coughs> by the doctors. Bec uh, I was getting blackouts. And you can't drive cars, a car when you're getting blackouts. I crashed my car. I crashed two cars within the space of a year. And uh, I'm convinced. I'm convinced. Now, you might laugh. Uh, no, you won't laugh. I know you won't laugh. Because I tell you, I was very taken today by uh, two of the churches I was in. Two of the churches I was in. I was amazed, actually, since I came here. And I said that today by the orthodox uh, way of doing things. I would never have believed as I said, uh, with the icons. You know, I, I would nev you'd never get in Ireland people coming in and blessing themselves in front of icons. You know, well, uh, there are no icons in Ireland with Catholicism, quite different, you know, but you would never get people obviously showing their devotion in that way. So, so very different. But the old people in Ireland, they had a different way of showing their devotion. Have you ever... Have you any such thing in our, uh, uh, here as holy wells? Have you? Kind of. Well, now, yes, holy springs, holy wells. Well, we had those all, all over uh, Ireland there, all over Ireland, for the old saints. And each saint in parishes, uh, they weren't sometimes, well, they were official, but the, the church got rid of them all in favour of St. Joseph or uh, of Our Lady uh, well, I prefer the old saints there's nothing wrong with the new ones you know, but, or St. Joseph or, or the Blessed Virgin or any of those but the old saints go way back to Celtic times and um, you get their holy wells and it tells you something about the history of a parish and who was who was what would I say who was um, the favourite of people maybe 
1500 years ago we have had a, we've had a very twisted history you see with the English and the English conquest of Ireland <coughs> and Irish Catholicism being kept down for so long and mass not allowed and people having to go up into mountainy places during the penal laws uh, in order to say mass it was forbidden for so long and for people to hold on to their faith for so long it, you know, it took a lot to, lot to do now as I say there I had two crashes uh, uh, three years ago and I am convinced I, I don't care what anybody said I had in my car uh, on both those cases I had a little piece of wood from one of from a branch of one of the sacred trees that grows over one of those wells in West Clare a well that is supposed to give you protection as a traveller now I didn't break it off you don't break off any wood from a branch of those trees if the branch falls off through age then you can use it now I did and I brought it with me inside the, you know the, the little thing you get for a camera for a film and just you know fl once you've used the film what did you call that um, the, the little plastic cylinder so I kept it under the seat of the car uh, as protection as travel and in each of those crashes and once I went across the road and smashed into the wall made bits of my car and walked, walked out of the car as if no, not a scratch and the second time was very clear and neither injured myself or anybody else which was equally important I could have killed somebody else neither time and I, I am convinced now you can call me superstitious or you can call me anything else but I think that little that little s had something to do with it and my wife might be inclined to laugh at that but I, I don't think she would because she's a maths and science teacher <laughs> 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 you know, but um, you know when I showed her that no I think she was impressed I think she was impressed also I wouldn't laugh at that I wouldn't laugh no because I've, I've heard too many old people's stories about being cured at holy wells if you have faith if you have faith if you laugh and are cynical you'll get no cure anywhere no but if you have faith then no um, I'm sorry I'm sorry what has anybody else ba because uh, I can't see you at the back because the light is shining in my glasses so I, I don't see if you have any questions please don't be a bit shy to ask Fairy Fort, and there are hundreds of them in Ireland, are round, big, big circles, big, uh, big circles in the landscape, some of them on the hillsides, and some of them uh, on flat ground. There's a ditch of earth all around them, and you have white thorn bushes growing on them. Now, white thorn, hawthorn, are fairy bushes. Blackthorn, no. Blackthorn, no. Whitethorn, yes. And especially if you see, and you will constantly, if you're passing, we'll say, through Ireland by road or by rail, sometimes you'll see out in the middle of a big field, you'll see a lone whitethorn bush. And sometimes it'll be, you know, in a modern farm. I've seen one uh, gone uh, on my way to Galway by train in a big, big field of, of what was it, um, rapeseed. Now there was somebody who, uh, who was a modern, modern farmer and I said, ah, look, look at the lone white thorn bush. In Ireland, Irish they call that a stiach. A stiach means a fairy bush. And I was saying to myself, ah, ah, he might be a modern farmer, but Look at, look at the old tradition obviously his father told him or his grandfather told him something now I'll tell you a story about that uh, and people by the way don't interfere with these fairy forts and by the way I'm getting phone calls constantly now uh, as if I was some bloody kind of psychologist <laughs> from, <laughs> from, from complete strangers but I'd always try to answer them 
because some of them are really worried people people who you know should I or shouldn't or oh no I when I was ploughing this field by accident I, I ploughed a bit of this fort and you try to reassure them look if it's by accident don't worry it's only if you did it deliberately um, I think I would go and maybe get the priest just to say a prayer uh, you know just to put their minds at ease and you know it can be a big worry for people and if you start worrying worry leads to worry leads to worry and people can do things that you know they mightn't otherwise do it's better to put people's mind at ease if you can if you can um, I'll tell you a story that really happened now you can call it coincidence or you can say oh, oh the man should have known better I think it was a case of where the man should have known better one of these forts uh, about three miles from where I live there was an old farmer he was in his 80s and there's a certain breed of farmer they will not retire he was a hardy old man I've seen I've seen plenty of that breed since I came to Russia you know I've seen heavy 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 set people and then I've seen the thin kind that look like they live to be a hundred you know they're, they're everywhere but you see some of these farmers they've worked hard all their life and they're not going to retire they see no reason to retire uh, if they ever go into a hospital or an old people's home they just fade away work 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 this is what keeps them alive now this fella had one son that's all he had in the family one son and if the man was 80 something well you can guess what age the son was do your sums the son was in his 50s and all around him the other farmers they had all handed over their farms to their sons and this son he hadn't got the farm yet and the other guys they were all getting married and this poor misfortune he couldn't get married because the farm hadn't been handed over to him and he was constantly saying to his father look dad why don't you take it easy what's the hell is why are you killing yourself here and the father said i will i i no, I, I, we'll do it shortly we'll do but you know putting it off and putting it off and putting it off like people do all the time now there was a fairy fort on the land and the son stupidly he was constantly saying to the father why don't we get rid of that just taking up space and it was how much space does a fort take up because look the cattle were free to wander into the fort and graze and that of course was only annoying the father trying to get rid of this and the father no no that fort was there before me and it'll be there when I'm gone I hope you haven't any notions of taking out it no 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 but every so often the son would bring it up why don't we no the son would go to the pub at night and he'd be giving out to his friends about the father stupid man stubborn old bastard you know and this kind of stuff and his friends they'd say why don't you leave him alone especially about the fort you're only making him more stubborn <coughs> time went on and time went on and eventually the son said out of pure disgust I'm going to England I'm sick of staying here I'm going to look where I can make some money I have nothing I haven't even the price of drink in this cursed place I'll go over to the buildings in England where I can get paid so the father saw that the writing was on the wall <laughs> now was the time the son was going and the father was going to be left there alone so he said alright alright he says alright we'll go into Innes tomorrow into the solicitor's office and we'll get the paper signed great they did everything was signed the farm was signed over to the son and that was fine the son did nothing about the fort for a while even though now he could but he said he'd leave it for a little while but a month or so passed now I suppose I suppose things are to be if they are to be a storm happened this particular night and when they came out in the morning <laughs> wasn't one of white thorn bushes in the fort 
blown down by the wind. Now, if it had blown into the fort, no problem. But it hadn't. It had blown out into the field. And the son said, look, look, taking up more space. Well, by God, he says, I'm going to get rid of that once and for all. Uh, I'll get the tractor and drag it out of it and dump it below in the corner of the field. And the father said, will you leave it be? You know the tradition. And the tradition always is, if a white thorn bush falls in a fort, don't touch it, leave it to rot there. But the son would have none of it. He was a modern man with his tractor. He got the tractor, he got a cable, a rope wouldn't do, he got a cable, looped the cable around the butt of the bush, up on the tractor and started to drag the bush out of it. Now, I suppose he had miscalculated because, you know, there was the bush down and there were the roots in the air. I suppose there was more earth and stones on the roots of the bush than he thought because when the <laughs> tautness came on the cable, all of a sudden the cable <laughs> snapped and you know a cable snapping is like a spring and of course when it did it <laughs> took the head clean off of him, killed him, killed him on the spot. So you know what the neighbour said? Did he get any sympathy? <laughs> Not a bit. Not a bit. All they said was, why didn't he listen to his father and leave the fort alone? The fort is still there. And you can see the gap. You can see the gap where the bush was. So, you know, you, you, you say to yourself, why are people so stupid? Why don't they listen? Why don't they listen to the old stories and the old traditions and for their own sake, for their own sake. And there are so many of these stories, not, not just from Clare, but from all over Ireland, that uh, I personally, I personally, uh, and I have been, I've been through college, I, I've done my MA in linguistics, as it, that doesn't matter. That doesn't matter uh, in, in the least. But uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't take anything out of the fort. And you can call me an idiot. You can call me superstitious. You can call me, but I'm alive. I'd be afraid that if I took anything out of the fort, I mightn't be alive for long. Because again, I, of the stories I have heard, of the kind of people who have done it and because of the kind of people who have told me the stories because believe you me I don't believe I, I don't believe all the stories I hear no way no way I'd always inquire first second third and fourth could this be true and I go back when somebody tells me a story to see the landscape that they have told me about is it there are they just making <coughs> this up and you'd be amazed the number of times where the place does exist, where the story was told about. It really does exist. Now, in itself, that doesn't prove that the stories I told about the place happened. But if I find that the person is a reliable person, then, like, like, the, like the first story I told, then you know, I, I probably would say, hmm, on balance, I can believe that. I would never believe a person who drinks too much. <laughs> uh -uh, because a person like that can... I'd never believe a person who is easily frightened in the night. Because, you know, boo! <laughs> I'd never, ever, 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 ever believe a person who's on drugs. No way. No chance. You know, because they will... Their, their, their mind will be gone crazy. But there are certain people who you could not frighten. I've known a few of those who have been out every hour of the night and if you tried to frighten them I tell you you, you were in big trouble <laughs> because <laughs> you you would you would uh. I tell you one of those men uh, he was like this excuse me 
when I came from where I from where I and I, I give you over then to music just just while I think of this one when I came from where I lived where I was brought up the card game that we used to play was called 31 I don't know what card game you play here but you, you have your own versions of all these 31 5 knave joker ace of hearts and then 10 9 8 7 6 5 they're down and when I went to clay they play a completely different game. Combs, they call it. <laughs> Combs. I go, what the hell is this? Or they call it the old game. Very difficult count. And they play three and three and three. Nine people. Now, I was watching this for a long, long time. Before I could get the hang of it. And then they won't allow you in. Because it's all the old fellas that play it among themselves. And they cheat like hell. They will, and they enjoy cheating. Now, they don't call it cheating. They call it playing tokens. Tokens, you know, they have all their own tokens. And, <laughs> and they, you know, they enjoy them. Uh, you know, them uh, you know, they, they all have, the, the, you know, yourself. They kind of, uh, <laughs> they, they have all, the, it's just comical to watch them. To, to as if the tokens weren't obvious if you study them but uh, it's um, you won't be invited in until somebody gets sick and one night I was invited in finally they asked me can you play after watching them for about six months uh, I said the only bother is if you make a mistake you are an idiot you'll be called every kind of a idiot you know that, that you're a complete oh and you'll be told it. You will be told it. So they'll have no mercy. But uh, anyway, because you see, these guys have been playing together for 30 years, some of them, until somebody dies. But anyway, anyway, I, st I, I, I said, I'll play, I'll try it. And of course, I found it most enjoyable. Great game, fantastic game. And I was asked a few times after that, but one of those players, Johnny was his name, he's dead since, God bless the man. But. Um, he told me a story, uh, and I thought it was a very, very interesting story, uh, that he would tell it to me. He said that one night he and his two partners were coming home from a particular pub. Now, he was a lunatic gambler, the same man. He'd play cards on Good Friday night, you know, that kind of a gambler. He was seven nights a week man. Not for money, not for money, just for enjoyment. And Johnny never drove, he never had a car, bike, bike only. But this particular night, himself and his two partners, they were coming home from a pub, Duggins, in Spansel Hill, where the famous Hoss Fair is held. And as they were coming on, as they were coming on, it was the usual circuit, you know, home, where he would always come. They were talking away, they had won a little bit of money, enough for cigarettes for the next couple of days. <laughs> now, the cigarettes that they used to smoke that time were woodbines, uh, coffin nails they used to be called, because they were so hash, no chips, no nothing, coffin nails, and uh, they used to sell them by the five, for you know, cheap, cheap bags. So anyway, they were coming home, delighted with themselves, and they were about halfway when they had to pass this junction, the chief junction. Now, normally, they'd all be going on the same road. But on that particular night, Johnny told me, his two partners said at the crossroads, he said, uh, sorry Johnny, we have to go this way tonight. No, he didn't question them. That was their own business. And all he said was, lads, I'll see you above in Tubber Tuesday night. Good luck, night. And off he went. Now, he had about half a mile still to go. Uh, you go, you use kilometres here, is it? Yeah. All right. Uh, that would be about um, uh, three quarters of a kilometre still to go. W we use kilometres too, not now, but uh, uh, three quarters of a kilometre still to go. But, but the difference was on this night, he was alone, and there was a fairy fort between him now and home, on the right hand side in the field. It's still there, it's still very much there. And he didn't feel easy passing it. It was all right when he had his two partners with him any other night. 
Mm, now that he was alone, mm, 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 you know. Uh, uh. So, as he came near the fort, what do you think he did? Yeah. He got down, he told me, he told me, he got down off his bike and he uh, went into the field on his left. Remember now the fort was on his right. He went into the field on his left, moonlit night, and he searched around, searched around until he found a cow dung. Cow shit. A cow dung. And he rubbed his hands in it. Yeah. Now, I was listening to all of this, and I said, what the hell was Johnny drunk? But I knew he wasn't drunk, because Johnny wasn't a drinking man. He had two half pints of Guinness, and that was it. Now, and he said, after that, he came out again, and up on his bike, and on he went past the fort. Uh-huh, fine. And as soon as he had passed the fort, left it well behind him, and before he went in home, of course, <laughs> he couldn't face his wife like that. Uh, he got down off his bike again and down into the drain, washed his hands, dried them, yeah, like that. And oh, he went in home, left his bike in the shed and in. And you know, his wife asked him, well, how do you do with the cards? You know, they, they'd always have a cup of tea before they go to bed. And she was none the wiser of what he had done. And it took me a long time to figure out, you know, what was all this about? And it was only later I found out, of course, that uh, that Johnny was afraid of the fort. And Johnny was a man now who was afraid of no human being at night. But he was afraid of the fairies. And you ask, what was this about? Well, what it was about was Johnny knew that there was one of the remedies if you meet the fairies, because the seven things the fairies are afraid of are something holy, something dirty, that's something red, iron or steel, fire, salt, and if you have none of those six, run. <laughs> But not just run, because they're faster than you are, always are, always will be, run for flowing water. And if you can get to flowing water, running water, and across that, you're safe, because they can't cross running water. Now, you'll ask the obvious question, and so did I, but hadn't he his bicycle? Shouldn't that have been enough, iron or steel? Yeah, I, I, I thought of that too. But I, I forgot to ask him that. And maybe he didn't think of it that night. You know, maybe if you're in a confusing position, maybe he wanted double protection. <laughs> yeah, because, because you remember what I was saying about the old man, the, uh, Jack Killory in North Clare, who told me, remember I was saying, uh, who, who told me that when he was young, and Jack died at the age of nearly 90, Jack told me that he, up to about the age of ten, his grandmother would never let him out in the evening time without doing two things, and she was quite sincere, without doing two things, without making the cross on his forehead with piss, urine, double protection, <laughs> something holy, something dirty. And you know, she wasn't being, she wasn't not being disrespectful to the cross. No way. Just giving him double protection. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's a strange thing. And the other thing was, you know, that uh, on May Eve, especially the dangerous, 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 you know, which is the six months before Halloween, May Eve was the other dangerous, the dangerous one. Uh, that was the one for all kinds of magic. You you didn't go out at all on May Eve, if you could help it. Uh, he said that um, she would if if he if he was going out at all, she wouldn't let him out without a petticoat. Because that was the time that the fairies took boy children as changelings. So 
the best way to save them was you know, make them wear a petticoat to make the fairies think that they were girls instead of boys because the fairies prefer boys rather than girls <coughs> yeah, it's very but true true but it's it's a uh, I tell you, I, I, I would have brought for you to see, because it's a remarkable thing, but I couldn't. Uh, if I'd have been stopped by the customs, because they would have said, what the hell are you bringing here? And I'd have thrown it away. Um, I remember three or four years ago, I was having my drink inside in that back snug in Clark's in Crusheen. Uh, on May night, in other words, the night of the 1st of May, I was having my pint of Guinness, as usual, excuse me, and the barman, he says, I have something to show you. Tell me when to shut up, please. <laughs> the barman, he says, I have something to show you, and he went in to the back room where the coolers are kept, you know, for the beer and all the rest of it, and he came out with a bag. An ordinary fertilizer bag, a 10, 10, 20 bag, closed at the top with cord, but hanging as if it had been hanging up. And he said, look what I got on my boundary fence hanging from a tree this morning. And you could see, sticking out of the top of the bag, three pointed hazel sticks. And you could feel inside in the bag the same three more, you know, th the same three sticks pointed at the other end as well. So three pointed hazel sticks pointed at both ends. And of course, immediately I knew what they were. They were Pishog sticks. Now, Pishogs are black magic. And it was somebody who had put those there in order to take away his look. Now, he knew that. <laughs> He's modern fellas. <laughs> nonsense but he said you might be interested in those uh, <laughs> you know. and of course I was because I had heard about these from the old people but I had never seen one of them so I took them of course because I would be going around to schools and I was certain if I hadn't seen them the children in schools had never seen them so I took them but remarkably I brought them home anyway that night delighted with myself and my wife was up correcting copies. As I told you, she's a science teacher, and she was there correcting copies. I brought it in anywhere, and immediately I did. She saw it. Out! Out! To get it out of the house! No, she, Jesus Christ, I said, what in God's name? Out! Get it out of the house! <laughs> like a beaten dog. <laughs> I had to take it down to the shed and stick it up onto the rafters, you know. And I said, why? Why? She was reared on a farm, you see. She knew exactly what it was and what it was for. I was reared in a village. I didn't. She did. And she knew precisely what it had been. It was, it was evil magic. Evil magic, you know, to take away your look. So anyway, um, I, I, had, I was told uh, you know, that there was a priest inside in the Franciscan friary in Ennis who was very good at these things. You know, he wouldn't laugh or anything else. So I took it in to him, just to bless it, to take the badness out of it. No, I didn't drive him. I took the bus, <laughs> just in case, just in case. If there was a crash, it might be blamed on these. But he did, he did, and he had a very interesting thing to say. He said, look, he said, there's no week in the year, but somebody doesn't bring me something like this. It doesn't always take the shape of these, he said. But he said, if you think that these things are gone since our grandfather's time, then you'd be very mistaken. And the answer, I suppose, is true. He says, uh, uh, bad and good, he says, are always in the same proportion in the world. And that's never going to change. You're always going to have good neighbours and bad neighbours. And that's the way things are. He blessed them anyway. And he says, look, let's take them away, he says, and do what you have to do. And I did, and I've been doing it since. Now, <laughs> I there's a funny story after that about him, and I'll, I'll shut up then when you can get on with your music. But <laughs> I took him to an, a, an old man that I knew would have a story about this kind of stuff. A very level-headed man. He was a, an air controller in Shannon Airport. And a person like that has got to be level-headed, surely. So I took him to him, 
And on the side, he had a bit of a farm. The man was never married, so he had to keep dry stock on the farm, because otherwise there'd be nobody to meet the cattle or anything else. So he kept dry stock. And I took him to him, just to have a look. Look, Mick, how about those? And <laughs> ah, he knew what they were all right. He knew exactly. And he told me this story. He said, look, I had an experience of this kind of stuff myself. Uh, everything on this farm of mine, he said, was going wrong, leading up to May Eve. And year by year by year, the cattle were getting sick and the crops were failing. Th things I couldn't explain. Now, he was a very careful man, very, very careful. But, no, things were just not right. And, of course, he consulted his neighbours just to see. And it was the very same with them. So they put their heads together and they had their suspicion on this local woman. Now, because it was mainly women who worked the Pishogs. I have to say, it was mainly women. And they had this suspicion on this local woman. Now, having suspicions is one thing, proving it is another. You might pick the wrong woman and be completely wrong. Uh, so Mick says, ah, what I'll do is, we'll check it out. It was coming up to May Eve again. The 31st of April is the time, between midnight and dawn on May morning. So his property was next to hers. So what he did was, he got a blanket and up he went on the ditch and pulled the blanket over himself and he watched. Now he said it was the coldest night, he said, and it was the most boring night he ever spent <laughs> waiting and waiting. Twelve o'clock, one o'clock came, two o'clock came, three, no moon, four o'clock came. He was falling asleep, he was falling asleep. And it was only the cold that was keeping him awake. I'm sure if he had seen Russian cold, he'd be dead. <laughs> he'd be dead. He'd be found frozen in the morning. But anyway, anyway, he, no, nothing, nothing happened. But just as it was dawning day, her door opened, and out she came. Now he thought she might be coming out to the small house. You know, the, the, the <laughs> there was no indoor sanitation in those days. He thought she might be coming out to the toilet outside. And he said, I wasn't spying on her. I wasn't spying on her in, in that sense. I just wanted to see, finally, was she the person. So, what do you think happened? Over across her field she came, towards my place. And I put down my head, of course, under the blanket. And luckily for me, <laughs> she didn't cross just where I was. She crossed several yards, a few metres, up along the ditch. Now, I was watching out from under the corner of the blanket. In over the ditch she came, and she started searching around in my field. And I was wondering, what for? And then she found it. Again, like the last story, a cow dung. A cow dung. And it was then I saw what she had in her other hand. A hook. A sickle. And she started pulling the sickle through the cow dung. And all for me, all for me, all for me. Now, I could hear her clearly because there was nobody else there in the dawn except me and her. What do you think I did, he said? <laughs> I pushed aside the blanket quietly and I crept up behind her. And she was so busy what she was doing, all for me, all for me. <laughs> she never saw me coming. Well, I gave her an almighty kick up the ass, he says. I turned her upside down. <laughs> and she ran for it. She could hardly run. <laughs> I nearly crippled her, he said. But, but, there was no more about it. There was no she couldn't report me to the guard, the police, you know. Uh, because what would she say? How could she explain what she was doing in my place at that time of that time? morning above all mornings there was no more about it and there was no more pishogs so that fixed it that fixed it he said but definitely they exist I in English they spell it P-I-S-H-O-G-U-E-S -E but it's an Irish word P-I-S-E-O for a G-S pishogs which means bad magic and it's done on May Eve 
and for all I know it's still going on you know if you have a grudge against your neighbours and you want to take away their crop sometimes it takes the form of raw meat buried in their garden we'll say in their potatoes and their potatoes will wither away and when they go to dig them they might be that size sometimes they take the form of eggs buried in their hay now some people will say come on hens lay out anywhere and they'll I lay eggs in the hay but but there's a problem what happens when you when the farmer with his hay knife goes up to cut his hay and he finds a clutch of eggs buried that deep down in the hay <laughs> hens don't lay, lay eggs that deep into the hay somebody put them there so you know it's 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 ugly it's ugly horrible work and priests long ago used to preach vehemently against this stuff off the altar at mass so they obviously believed it hmm. it, it's not nice not nice <laughs> now where are the musicians <coughs> they'd let me talk all night while they just sit there <laughs> By the way, can I... Am I clear enough? Yeah. 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 It would be an awful thing if I was talking away and not to be understood. <laughs> I think. So, <laughs> uh, they're actually called Polkandri, and that's an Irish for, uh, well, like, King's Polka or Kingly Polka. And Polkas, um, well, actually, they're very popular in the County Kerry, County Kerry meets Cork Limerick, and that's, again, the area which they call Schlilluchra. Um They also play West Kerry Polkas, naturally, and uh, we've invited a mighty West Kerry family before that, so that's not the first Kerryman come into Moscow. Uh, we've invited Brandon Begley and his two sons, the accordion player and singer, fantastic. And so I hope you would see some more mighty Kerryman around here <laughs> sometime. Uh, but for now, we'd play a Kerry reel, uh, followed by a West Clare tune. And um, the first one is associated with uh, the plane of Dennis Murphy, it's called Macross Abbey, whoever was to carry, uh, he would definitely see Macross Abbey, it's a famous Abbey uh, near Killarney. But the second one uh, is actually from around the place uh, where uh, Eddie now lives, and uh, it was composed by the man whom, uh, from whom he collected some stories, actually, uh, his name is Junior Crehan. And Junior Crehan, um, a great Clare, West Clare fiddle player um, and composer, kind of folk composer, uh, he composed quite a number of very popular tunes. Um, and this is one of them. It's called the West Clare Railway. And, well, practically, West Clare Railway uh, is now not functioning. It's like non existent, it's kind of a museum. But you can walk along, it's the rail is still there, although there are no trains. And uh, Eddie once did, actually, and he's written a book, kind of a very thick book, uh, about these stories he collected along the route. Um, you know, uh, as you probably imagine, Ireland is 
you know, Moscow region is half Ireland, I'd say, but if you long if you walk along this very small piece of uh, you know uh, railway you still collect lots and lots of stories from the local people because irish uh, they love stories they love music and singing and uh, there's lots of traditions still alive and uh, lots of traditions still remembered and i think that's something to learn from Anyway, here are two reels. <laughs> presume uh, you have a lot of questions to Eddie Steele, so it's time to ask them. Sign that for you after, if you wish. If, if you wish. 
Sorry, if if there's any questions before I before I do any other one, please uh, please ask. I don't know whether I had any copy of uh, Six Terrible Women CD with me or not. Sold out. Oh, is it gone? Oh, right, right. Okay, probably I didn't have enough. Um, tell me, if there's any question, please, please ask. Uh, don't, don't jump in anyway, sure. Yes, please. I did, but it's a long time ago. It's a long time ago. I don't go there very often, and they're quite near me. No, that's the truth. I don't. My, my problem. My problem is, put very, very simply, I don't get paid for uh, for collecting stories. I just collect them because I like to collect stories. I have never got paid for collecting stories over the all the years I've been doing it. Um, it's an expensive business to collect stories because petrol <laughs> is very expensive in Ireland. Uh, we pay, I don't know, I've been trying to figure out at garages here by your um, petrol signs how much a litre petrol is. What? Oh my God! You're getting it for nothing. <laughs> Drive to Vladivostok while you can, <laughs> because in Ireland it's one sixty-one, one sixty-one a liter. Um, it's it's you know it's extremely expensive, and diesel is one fifty-four, and th the only reason for that is to give business a help so the truckers and all the rest of it wouldn't feel too hard done by. So, you know, it's, it's expensive uh, to collect uh, stories. That's one way of putting it, I suppose. Yeah. Is it that dear here, Guinness? Oh, that's that's crucifying. Yeah, that's not nice. Well, I suppose you feel you're doing your purgatory by by drinking Guinness. <laughs> I suppose. I suppose that's one way of looking at it. Yeah, that's uh, that's crazy. But then again, I suppose the shipping costs are, are yeah. yeah. I bet you if they made it in China. It wouldn't be that dear. It would. Really? Uh, under ah oh yeah, yeah. It probably wouldn't be as good. Um, yeah. Because I've drunk it in other places too. Uh, I wouldn't drink the English version of it. Uh, no, I mean not nothing to do with politics or anything. No, it just doesn't taste as good. It doesn't travel well. Any of you who come to Ireland, uh, being used to it in Russia we'll say and you drink to it in Ireland you say these are two different uh, products as I'm sure some of you have <laughs> done <laughs> uh, yeah. it is it natu <laughs> naturally you know because it's a different animal mm. yeah. um, as regards the, the thing here itself you know this please I like to collect them simply because as I said there uh, as an introduction, as the as the dedication to the Black Book, to all those tellers now gone, whose voices are not forgotten, and to those still with us, whose knowledge is more indispensable than ever. Because if those stories aren't collected, the generation to come will be missing something that is vital. You see, the problem is, in Russia, Russia is a huge country, country stretching over two continents. Ireland is only a little dot on the map. A dot, which now in fairness is, is well known because of its um, poetry, I suppose, and its stories and its music. And it was delightful to me to see this St. Patrick's Day 
uh, that even the pyramids were made green. Now that's unusual for a tiny, 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 tiny little country out of all proportion to its size that Ireland is known all over the world. But these things should not be, you know, they shouldn't be neglected. And what a lot of people do not know is that the Irish Folklore Archive in University College Dublin is the biggest in Western Europe. Because the Irish Folklore Commission, through the foresight of a few people, was founded in the 1920s. People who saw that this kind of stuff will be valuable someday, and it is now. It now is. People come from all over the world to get material from it that they should have got in their own countries, but at the time people thought, ah, this is only rubbish. Now they regret it in their own countries. But it's gone. You can't, n you can't neglect this kind of stuff and expect it will be there forever, because as soon as the people die, they're gone. This is me on a very very small scale that's what I have been trying to do now I can I can look at the stuff I have on my shelves and I can see this person 94 that person 96 that person 87 this person 89 that person they're all dead that that book you have there on your in your hand uh, could I just have it for a minute in search of Biddy early there at the back you'll see the index of people who gave me the stories about that remarkable woman. Uh, that was published in 1988. It has gone through eight editions. All of those people are dead. Every single one of them. On, if I hadn't been lucky enough to meet them when I did, it was all gone with them. So uh, it's I who have been lucky, not them. I've been the lucky one to have met them and it's great to have sat down with them because the trouble about the stuff in the archives in Dublin, wonderful as it is, is it's different to write it down but it's a different thing to hear it and if I had the money at the time to have filmed it, it would have added another dimension again but at least to have photos photos of the people who told me this. Which I know isn't the uh, ideal thing, but it's something. It's something. I have their voices and I have black and white or sometimes colour photographs. I prefer black and white. The black and white portrait is much more appropriate, especially for an old person. Especially if it's taken by somebody who knows his or her business. It's a, it's um, it's nice. Uh, now, what can I do next? A any any other? All the stories are mostly from uh, flood topics in this country. Are they? The f are the stories from the first half of the twentieth century? Ah. Uh, No, from other times as well, because some of the stories that survive, uh, they survive, they go way back to heroic times. For example, the stories of Cúchollin. Cúchollin was one of the mythical heroes of Ireland. No, yeah, I have heard, I've been lucky enough in West Clare to hear stories of Cú Cullen, the Hound of Cullen. And now, rarely will you hear those kind of stories. I have on a couple of occasions. And as soon as you hear those, you know, your ears go up. Mm, I'm d please, please tell me this, because it's only once in two lifetimes. Nowadays, you hear stories like that. They're gone. They're gone. But sometimes you are lucky enough to meet something like that. Two weeks ago I was visiting an old man of a hundred and one and he had recently had a, 
cataract removed from his eye. Now, before that, he couldn't read or he couldn't write because he was blind with cataracts. And because of his age, they didn't know whether they should operate or not. You know, you can imagine, 101? They could do more damage than, than good. But he said, look, I'm blind anyway. Why not operate on one eye? Chance it. Try it. So they did. Because he was a healthy old man for 101. And it was a perfect success. <laughs> so I, uh, when I called, there he was, reading the paper. Delighted with himself. A new man. And uh, he welcomed me, and uh, oh, I was I was delighted to see him too. He kept me there a couple of hours talking. I told him what my next book was about to be, the power of the priest. And uh, he told me five priest stories, excellent stories. And he told me to be sure to call again. He he'd have more for me because he was getting his second eye done now and that would give him more more uh, hope or you know whatever you you call it so you know you meet wonderful people in this job as soon as i get home i'm going to meet an old man of 102 and they're great to do in ireland the old people what we call tracing now, I'm not good at tracing. I'm no good at tracing. Tracing, I don't know, you probably have a Russian word for it. Tracing means calculating back through the family trees. Who is related to whose second cousins, first cousins, mother's father, grandfather's uncle. The, and I'd be there, holy God almighty, how did I remember these? Because I'm lost already, but... I have my microphone there, and uh, yes, I haven't a clue anyway. This, but it'll all come out, and this will be worthwhile to somebody. Uh, yeah. And you know how they keep this in their memory, I do not know. But they do, and it's wonderful. That uh, now I presume the way they can do this is they have heard it so often, sitting by the fire at night, listening, listening, and listening again when there was no radio or television. But it just shows there's nothing wrong with their mind. Great stuff. Wonderful stuff. Some people would be bored with this and they'd say, oh, what's the purpose of this nonsense? But it's history. It's history. And there again, if that isn't got now, well, it's not just history, it's genealogy. If that isn't got now, uh, it's gone. Now, I should tell you a story about, or maybe I shouldn't, <laughs> about a man who, maybe you heard of the film The Horse Whisperer, which I found afterwards was a load of nonsense. There was no such thing. It was a typical Hollywood makeup, <laughs> as an, an awful lot of Hollywood stuff is. But I heard genuinely of a horse whisperer and I knew him. But I didn't know he was a horse whisperer until he was dead. I knew him as an old man. He lived in the parish of Kilmele, which is in central Clare. A lovely man. Genuine man. And I just knew him as a good storyteller, an excellent storyteller, and a, as a very, very enjoyable man to sit down and listen to. But like I say, it was only when he was dead that people told me that he could talk to horses. If there was a mad horse, a wild horse, particularly a stallion who had been injured and who needed to be shod, and you know yourself, if a stallion like that needs to be shod, one kick from that stallion could kill you. And blacksmiths, as you know, they were skillful men and strong men, but a stallion 
like that inside in the forge, what chance would a smith have? No, no chance. Now this man, John, a smith would sin for him, and whatever power John had, he could coax the horse, talk to the horse, and the horse would calm down. Now nobody knew where he got the power, but he had it. And you know, some people have powers like that. Another man might have the power to stop bleeding. You know, people, people have various cues. John's was that he could talk to horses and calm them down. But as well as that, he was a very kind, obliging neighbour. This particular neighbour of his, a next door neighbour, his wife was sick, very sick, and expected to die. Now, doctors were scarce that time, and the nearest doctor was in Milltown Malbay. <laughs> You've heard of Milltown Malbay, that yeah? you? You particularly know about no. Milltown Malbay. <laughs> Big festival, music festival held there. It's in West Clare. Music festival held there every year. The nearest doctor was in Milltown Malbay, about 12 miles away. And it was a dark night, and the poor woman was sick in bed. And the neighbour could not leave his wife, because, because if she died, what would the neighbour think? I left my wife, she died, and I not there. So John was his next door neighbour, and he asked John, look, would there be any possibility at all, I hate to ask you, that you'd go for the doctor? No problem at all, said John. Why wouldn't I? Wouldn't any person do that for a neighbour? John tackled up his own horse, saddled the horse, and off he went for the, for the, the doctor. The doctor came, and and he did what he could for the woman he did what any doctor could do and he gave her the medicine and he said she'll last until the morning don't worry don't worry she'll last until the morning and if she doesn't we'll bring her to the hospital the doctor went home and yeah and that was fine but uh, before before the the uh, morning came she took a, w a turn for the worse, and John had to go again. Now, the doctor naturally didn't like to be called out twice. I suppose, you know, he was like any doctor. It was a rainy, wet, horrible night, uh, and uh, as soon as he saw John at the door, oh God, he, you know, he didn't say anything, but you could know by his face that... Mm, mm. So, all he said was, he rummaged around in his bag, and I suppose having seen the woman in the bed once, rummaged around and gave John a bottle. Give her that, give her that, and she'll be all right. So back went John, wondering now what would he say to the neighbour. And uh, as he went back, of course, through the cold and the storm, you know, uh, uh, the wind had blown up by now, he was saturated wet. He was wondering was there any way at all that he could shorten his journey? He came to this crossroads, T-junction, and he knew that if he took that road, it would take about three miles, about four and a half kilometers off of his road. Now, he hadn't travelled that road very often. It was only a small little road with grass in the middle. And he knew he should keep to the main road but look when you're cold and wet and miserable what do you do he said he chances and he did on he went through the dark and eventually he came to this little s mm, twist in the road at a small bridge and at that bridge the horse stopped dead now John odds the horse on, go on, go on, and no chance. The horse, it was like its front hooves were stuck to the road, would not move. Now, John, like I told you, he could talk to a horse, and he was no man, he wouldn't use a whip on a horse like another person might. He talked to the horse to try to make the horse go. No chance, the horse would not budge. So John dismounted, and he tried to pull the horse by the reins past that place. No way. No chance. The horse wouldn't move. Now, 
he wondered what should he do because because if 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 he went back to the main road it would be more delay he had the medicine and he was afraid the man's wife might be dead he had no choice what he did was he tied the reins to a bush there he didn't like leaving his hus but he tied the reins to a bush there and on he walked he arrived at the house and wet drenched wet and uh, he gave to the medicine to, to the, the man of the house and, and of course the man asked Where, where's your hus uh, never mind that said John We'll see about that tomorrow. There's the medicine for your wife. And he went, the man took the medicine. John went home. And his wife asked him the same question. Where's the horse? He made some excuse. Changed his clothes. Had a cup of tea. Went to bed. Following morning. First question was over to see. Was the woman all right? She was, thank God. And secondly went back for his horse and uh, of course uh, the horse was fine but he was just untying the reins from the bush uh, and he wanted to know what might have held up the horse why was the horse you know, behaving the night before like it did was there anything there was there something strange was there was nothing strange just the bush on the ditch that he had tied it to now, if there had been a lone bush, a shliach, fine, that would be, you know, an explanation. But it wasn't a lone bush he had tied the horse to, it was just a bush on the ditch. And he was looking around him for anything else. No, no, there was nothing strange at all. And he was just turning to go when there was a house nearby and the door opened. And a man came out and was watching him. The man called him, and he said to John, uh, <laughs> You had a bit of trouble, I noticed. I had, said John, breaking up. My horse let me down there last night. Last night. <laughs> I'm not surprised to hear that, said the man. How do you mean, said John. Well, I'll tell you what I meant. started counting on his fingers for nearly the best part he said of 18 years ago I think I need a man here to come from the west like you did there last night and just there at that spot something ran out in front of his horse maybe it was a rat or a rabbit I don't know what it was but the horse shied and threw him back against the corner of the bridge there Because, as you know, as well as I do, and the old people always knew, there's two animals that can see the other world. And you know what they are. Hmm? A horse. No, not a cat at all. And you'd imagine cats are because they're associated with witches and broomsticks and all. No, not cats, funny enough. Yes. Horses and dogs. the other world. No, maybe in Russian tradition it's different. Maybe maybe in Russian tradition it's different. That could very well be. But in in Irish tradition they always said that the two animals that can see the other world is a horse and a dog. And that a horse especially is sensitive to the other world. And when they know that something like that is present, they will not pass so and John, I knew him well, I knew him well, and uh, he was the most interesting man, but like I said to you, all the stories I collect, none of them are from the archive, every one of them I collected myself from the old people. I didn't want to collect any stories out of the archives because they have all been used before and before and before. I wanted something completely new. That's that's why the next one as well, the power of the priest.
will be new. And by the way, I'll tell you, uh, I probably should shut my mouth now. Uh, I'll tell you this one, and it'll give you a strange uh, example, maybe, of what the kind of story I'm doing about priests will be. Whether you priests here would appreciate these kind of stories or not, or whether there would be the same kind of stories that we would have about priests in Ireland. This is one. And it was told to me, again, by an old man in West Clare. It's, I always found it odd, this one. And I, it had me asking myself, why? What's Christian about this? It doesn't make sense. But how, how many of you know what turf is? Peat. Peat. You know, which we burn for the winter as fuel. Now, there was this particular priest in West Clare. And because priests hadn't married in the Catholic Church, what people used to do for them is that parishioners would cut their turf in order that the priest would have fuel for the winter, which was only natural enough because since a priest would have no family of his own, you know, what else, where else would he get uh, fuel? So his parishioners would cut the turf for him. Now, when the turf was cut, you know, they'd they cut it, they, they would have a special spade for cutting it in the bog and throw it out. Had work, I tell you, I used to do it, but we don't do it anymore. It's easier to buy coal now. <laughs> but uh, had work with a a schlan, as they call it, a turf spade. You know, it has it has a, a wing on it like that. But in any case, it lies then flat down. But you have to rise it up then so that the sun and the wind will dry it. Now, what used to be done was the school, the local school children, the senior classes of the primary school, they would get a day off school in order to, as they would call it, foot the turf. In other words, put it standing so that the wind and the sun would dry it. And of course the children would be delighted as a kind of to get a half holiday from school to do this. They would be <laughs> looking forward to getting this holiday. And now the priest would come to the school and ask the, the, the principal of the school would there be any possibility that the children could... Now the principal couldn't refuse because the priest was the manager of the school. So, you know, <laughs> it was all a kind of a formality. No problem, Father. No problem. I'll send them up tomorrow to the bog in order to do the job. Thank you very much, and everything would get done. Now, on this particular occasion, the turf had been cut. It was all lying flat above with all the rest of the people's turf there. And the priest came down to the school, all very pleasant, down to the master, the schoolmaster. Any chance the children could be sent up tomorrow, third, fourth and fifth class, or was it fourth, fifth and sixth classes? No problem, ma Father, we'll send them up tomorrow. And the children did go up. Now, there was only one small problem. When they went up to the bog, uh, how could they distinguish the priest's turf from the next bank of turf? and the next, and the next. For all the turf looked the same when it was all lying flat. No, above, cut. And of course the poor children, they didn't know. But there was a man there, so they asked him, um, excuse us sir, which is the priest's bank? Now he's a clever lad. <laughs> and he saw the opportunity of getting his own turf footed. <laughs> so he said, um, there, of course, pointing to his own turf. And of course the innocent children, they didn't know any better. So they started footing mm -hmm, the man's turf and did a good job. Now, the priest was a kindly man and he sent up somebody with some food and a gallon of tea uh, in the middle of the day. Fine, the children sat down and they had their meal and they had their tea. They'd bring back the gallon afterwards to the priest's house. And after their meal, they sat it in again and they footed the rest of the turf and they had it all done by evening, except it wasn't the priest's turf that was done. It was the other man's turf. They left in the evening, having done a good day's work. A week passed, good sunny weather. The priest came to see his turf. 
it should be ready now for second footing you know to be turned up the other way so that uh, the bottom of it would dry as well only when he arrived there was his own turf lying as flat as the day and as wet as the day it was cut well the man was in a rage after he feeding the ungrateful children nothing done and he drew the conclusion of course that the blackguards after being let out of school for a half day had gone to the seashore or something you know because the place is very near the sea uh, that they had gone d down to the seashore playing football or something well he went immediately to the school stormed in and almost attacked the master where are they where are they these these bloody <laughs> he used choice language anyway and uh, of course immediately the poor children you know <laughs> they're frightened out of their wits of the priest and when the priest saw the poor children were frightened genuinely he calmed down he calmed down and he picked out one of them and he said what happened what happened above there in the bog and, and Oh, the poor child, no, shaking, explained about the man, the man who took... What man? And the child described the man who had directed them, you know, to the priest, his own, uh, 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 turf. And immediately the priest recognised what had happened. And you know what happened? As I was told the story, Two days later, that man walked over to the neighbouring pier, put his cap on the end of the pier, walked off the pier and committed suicide. And I always thought, you know, oh yeah, it showed the priest's power all right, but I thought, over a bank of turf and then commit suicide and then change things strange Christianity strange, <laughs> church, strange values but I put it in because that genuinely was the story I was told by the old man I'm not saying it's true or I'm not saying it's false or I'm not saying anything but um, that's you know so priest's curses could be a very dangerous thing if you got on the wrong side and there's plenty of stories for example where priests and landlords I could understand those because English landlords you know priests were the only person that finally you could go to if you ran into trouble with the landlord because Irish people were <coughs> kept down for so long and you had no reco you had no recourse to anybody else because the landlord had the police and the magistrate and everybody else very often the, the the landlord was the magistrate he was the jp the justice of the peace so where did you go you became a highwayman but if you became a highwayman that was what was waiting for you so you, know, you had nowhere to go except the priest. He was your final, you know, he was the one who finally might be able to protect you. And there are plenty stories in Irish folklore about the poor man's cattle being driven away and they consult the priest. And he was the one who, when the peelers, that was a contemptuous name for the police, the peelers, after Sir Robert Peel, he was the one who founded them. And uh, uh, even that today, that name is used about the, the police in Ireland, or the peelers. When you want to call the, the police something bad, you, know, you call them the peelers. It's from British times. But um, he's the one, very often, who stuck them to the road. And the, the reputation, he stick them to the road so that the poor man could claim back his cow again and drive him away. While the poor peelers were stuck to the road and could do nothing about it except stand there in frustration and only be released when the police or when the priest wanted them to be released. Now there are plenty of stories like that. So I don't know whether you have any stories like that in Russia or not uh, about your priests. 
because I'm sure you had plenty of repression in Russia, Russia as well as we had repression in Ireland. It'd be interesting to see whether whether there's any similarities between between the the religious stories of Russia and the religious stories of Ireland. I wonder has anybody ever done um, a, a, a study like that? Because my son is doing a very interesting. Uh, interesting study at the moment. It is of German soldiers, and he has found it very, very difficult to get to talk. But of German soldiers who fought on the Eastern Front in the Second World War, and when they came home, what was the reaction? Now, my and th what the interest for this for me of this for me was my two uncles fought with the British Navy in the Second World War and they couldn't come home to their native place because they fought with the English <coughs> they never came home because they fought with the English he is trying to you know what was the reaction when these German soldiers came home because they were with the Nazis you know, you know so it's a delicate subject very delicate subject he has found a few who were willing to talk and it's, it's delicate and interesting after all those years yeah we're trying to uh, I'm trying to with my 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 relatives and the British he with that and the Germans because that's where he works in Germany but it it makes a it makes an interesting subject <laughs> a long way from folklore you might say but not so not so long because it still me means talking to people sometimes about things that they feel uncomfortable with I'm sometimes asked, why can't I turn over my archive of all those 37 years of talking? Uh, why can't I turn them over to some public body? And I've been asked many times, why? I've been offered PhD twice by universities for that collection. I don't, I say, I don't want a PhD. I don't want any. I can't because there's too much uh, private material in the in those interviews. Stuff that can never be let out. For example, <laughs> I, I, it doesn't matter here because I can I mention no names or place. But not so far from where I live, there was a, an awful deed committed. I was here this evening down at mass in an Orthodox church. I was curious. But I also just wanted to go to Mass on Saturday evening because I, I do always go to a Sunday Mass at home anywhere and this will fulfill my Mass obligation just as well as if I was going to Catholic Mass because for me Catholic, Catholic or, or Orthodox are the very same thing. You know, if you go to Mass or Catholic or Orthodox, Mass is Mass. But there was, and nobody wants to talk to it, uh, talk about it. Very. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's not far at all from where I live. There was a man's throat cut during mass, during the consecration, at mass. Now, can you imagine that? Somebody. You know the old cutthroat razors. You know the old ones the open out razors not the safety razors the old and this guy who it was all over a woman being attacked and uh, somebody hired this lunatic to do it now he could have done this in a dark lane way quietly but he was a head case so he decided that the place to do it was in church at mass not at, not at the back of the church, but at the consecration, when everybody would have their 
heads down <laughs> at the holiest uh, holiest moment of the mass <laughs> Jeez, think of it he came up behind he, he positioned himself behind the fellow took out his razor and <coughs> cut his throat now luckily luckily maybe God was minding him he had one of those high starched collars on him and the razor only half cut his throat now he bled like a pig of course but the the local blacksmith was behind the fellow who was doing it and he saw what was happening he grabbed a hold of him and flung him out into the aisle of the church and he ran for it now there was confusion in the church of course as you might expect utter confusion and your man escaped in the confusion afterwards he escaped to America and did very well in America I believe and prospered in America but uh, the church had to be closed up the bishop had to come because when blood is spilt in a church it has to be rededicated it was the bishop had to come and rededicate the church and uh, everybody nobody would talk about it but you know yourself there is no such thing as a secret <laughs> you'll always find out what happened in the end and all all it takes is some person to tell you a little bit of the story a little bit and then and then from that little bit you'll find out because as soon as you know the little bit and tell of the little bit you know then the whole thing comes tumbling out hold on hold on a minute you you have it wrong this this is the right version and and then it comes on and on and on and from that i found out what really did happen and it was not a nice story i tell you uh, that's the kind of stuff i have in my archives and more and more and more and that's the reason why you, you can never give those archives to anybody because an awful lot of the material is too sensitive and it would offend too many people if you did and it would not be fair on we'll say grandchildren of some of the people it happened to because they may not know it ever happened it wouldn't be fair on them because some families they don't and they didn't ever talk about it could you blame them no no some secrets don't come down in families and rightly so rightly so people just want to bury all that and leave it leave it it's better so maybe somebody else has uh, has um, something to say hmm? I've kept you too long entirely. Yes, please.
he wants to be with her husband, you know, as they do, as they do um, at her cousin, as we speak of it, as they do at her cousin. And you know her question, her, her answer? How much? And I thought, you know, how good can we get? How much? She thought that was going to pass her head. That's the way your thinking forget about it. And, and then my wife um, and her mother would be when I asked her um, you know I have two kids at home why don't you just tell your mother have a listen to her again she did not want to hear her voice no she didn't want to hear her mother and again I thought oh, what a pity you know, I, with all my recording I have only a very very fuzzy recording of my father I would love to have, I would love to have more of him. And I do not. And I suppose that's typical. You know, the person that you should have more of, you, you, you put it off and put it off. Uh, yeah, yeah, I will, I will, I will. And then they're gone. But you know, you always, you always go to somebody else first. I'm lucky. I'm lucky in that I met out of 37 years four four good Kerry people. Just four. Now that will tell you they're not common. Anybody who thinks storytellers are common is making a mistake. And by what uh, by that I mean somebody you can keep going back to again and again and again and again and again and never come to the end of. Never come to the end of. I remember one man, Jim Blackwell. He was, he died at the age of 97, about three, four years ago. And if he lived to be a lot older, I'd still be going back to him. And the great thing about him was, his people were all Protestant. He was Catholic. And I think that helped. You know, the, the conversion. You could get me both sides. Uh, and, and that is great. His father was his sorry, his grandfather was the, was the governor of Limerick Jail. Again, he was he was um, he was so many different things. His father lived through the troubles in Ireland. He served under the British. He was um, a justice of the peace under the British. He served under the new administration in Ireland. You know, there were just interesting people. Jim himself was not political at all, but a wonderful fisherman, a great man for nature. He, you know, he was just so many interests. The man that I uh, began collecting under was an old, old farmer who lived until 85. He spoke as much Irish as English, and he was living in my own parish. I didn't know him at all. It was my father knew him, pointed me in his direction, talked to him, and I tell you, he <laughs> I played uh, a tape of him recently of him getting drunk in 1908. 1908. You know, can you think of it? That's a long time ago. And he could personally remember the great snowstorm of 1895. Personally, he was there. And he told me that when he was young, the schoolmaster, the, when he was at school, the postman used to come with letters to the school rather than take them around to the houses, you know, because it was all on foot that time. He had no bicycle. He had to walk to the houses and deliver the letters by hand. And rather than do that, <coughs> and he'd be walking all day, he'd bring them to the school and give them to the young fellas, the pupils. No, if he was caught doing that, he'd, he'd be dismissed. He'd lose his job. Sure. But the schoolmaster would tell the pupils, look, he sure will be delivered back home. Now, Jack remembers, the old man remembers, the schoolmaster often asking the postman any news from the war. 
those people and record them before they die. So, amazing, amazing people. If he was alive now, what age would he be? He'd be just past 130. Because he was 94, 93, I think, when he died. Anyway, do you want to play another one? Yes, yes, please. Oh, Ingrid. Ingrid. Yeah. Here's the Lord guide you home. Part one, guide you home. Part me, me, me and Greg. Then we are. Ah, I'm a Diego. Oh, sad, miss you, Mucha Greg. In some grave part. The work she did, Mother Poon. I'd be very surprised if there's there's a group of storytellers in Ireland. They call themselves the storytellers of Ireland. Simple as that. Storytellers. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm I'm almost certain storytellers of Ireland. They're just uh, an umbrella group. They call themselves that. And uh, storytellers of Ireland. And I'm not in that particular group. But. Under that, you'll find <coughs> who is in there, and they probably each have a website, and you know, you'll find more. Yeah. But definitely, well worth looking up is uh, the Folklore Society of Ireland. Uh, they're in University College Dublin, and they are the professional folklorists. If you if you ever wanted to get onto their website and after that if you wanted to become a member of their society, it's you know they they they, they do they do they bring out a magazine a journal every year. Yeah. Is that yeah their archive is is probably as I said the best in in Western Europe. And uh, they probably have, I, I'm quite sure they have back numbers of all their um, magazine. What else could I suggest? I, what I can do is, if any of you have any questions, when I get back, my card is there. Now, I had a, a little problem with my card. And... <coughs> not so much a problem with my card but a, a new website was made out for me it was updated and modernised and it was previously IE and if you get a card there change the IE to NET that's all you have to do NET instead huh? Well, it's it sh what's down there is IE, which is the Irish one. IE, change IE to NET, and it'll be okay. If you want to get through to me, if you have any question, and when I get home, I'll put together some kind of a list for you, and I will answer you. Sometimes it takes me a little while to answer because I am not the best when it comes to computers, but I will. I will answer, I promise. All right, musicians. Now, come on, you, <laughs> you, you lazy crowd. anyone is anxious to ask Eddie more questions he's not leaving Moscow yet and we'll have more nights ahead and he'll tell 
different stories altogether because he has hundreds of them, I presume, maybe thousands, who knows. <laughs> but um, uh, if you want to come, just ask me or ID, better me, uh, I guess, and I'll tell you when next sessions are. And it's been a it's been a fantastic night, and uh, we're so surprised so many people came. And uh, thank you, thank you for coming today. And uh, well, I think it's you who've been lucky. <laughs> Just a minute, I'll fetch my fiddle. as always <laughs> good <laughs> Евгений Казинков, Антон Зири. Вот. Обращайтесь ко мне, если хотите узнать по поводу следующих сторителлингов Эдди. И огромное спасибо клубу, книжному магазину Гиперион за то, что нас здесь приютили. Вот. И на самом деле в такой уютной обстановке мы смогли устроить вечер с Эдди. Спасибо всем большое.